receive the call to worship. God would call us to worship him in spirit and in truth from his own word as an example and a precept for us. And in Psalm 66, we read an, an exhortation, make a joyful shout to God, all the earth, sing out the honor of his name, make his praise glorious, say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall subdue themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Beloved congregation, the reason the whole earth will sing praises to the name of God is because the whole earth is made by God and owes everything to God. The reason we lead the way of all of the earth is because in addition to being made, we've been remade, recreated in the image of Christ by his work on the cross and his Holy Spirit. Praises to God. Let them ring out from our own midst in this evening worship. Receive God's benediction. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship in song number 120, which is a versification of Psalm 166. <clears throat> 120, let's sing the four stanzas, Come all ye people, bless our God. privilege now to confess our faith. Believer, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our worship continues in song number 106. <clears throat> Do ye, O men, speak righteousness? We're going to be speaking of hearts and words tonight in the light of Jesus' words in Matthew 12. Think of this as you're singing Psalm um, 58, four stanzas of 106.
Let's pray together. Oh God, our Father who art in heaven, we know your address. You know ours. We know you. You know us. And Lord, we send our heart's desires to heaven now and our heart's knowledge is revealed in our desires and our supplications. And we pray that you would truly bless us as we pray, maybe as never before, a real prayer, a thinking of other things, a praying and expecting only that the prayer bounces off the ceiling. Lord, we pray to you. And the words we utter, prompted by your own Holy Spirit, are heard in heaven from another being than we are, another uncreated being, God of God's fount of all being, and the Lord the judge, and our Father for the sake of Jesus Christ whom you've sent to be with us in this world. We love you, Lord. You know that. You've worked your love in us. This is love. Not that we loved you, but you've loved us. It's all God first. You are our Father, then we become children. You are the God of the decree, and we are chosen. The God of your own good pleasure, and we are chosen to be happy in you. The God who's love, and you love us, and we love you back, and we know that you will never leave us nor forsake us. For your love is truly divine. Nothing conditional about it, nothing that we earn, nothing tenuous, nothing which would draw back and so that you love us no more. You love us. For we're loved in Jesus Christ, and in him you would have all the preeminence. In his being praised, in his being the faithful Savior, dying for us and living for us, and ever interceding for us, there is your glory. And we are kept and saved, and we are led all the way to glory. We need not fear. Thanks, Lord, for this gift of prayer. And the things that we can pray, everything, everything on our mind, every heart's desire, every need, we can confess to you. And we pray with the Bible open, being directed by the Spirit there and our spirits within, to say words that are pleasing to you, to praise you with all the earth, and to lead the way as your creatures and as your redeemed people, to confess our sins, to show our hearts. God in heaven, hallowed be your name by us. Maybe there's some with burdens and cares that are unknown except to you. Lord, as the body of Christ, we pray for that person, those persons, that family, whatever it is, whoever. We pray, Father, you would bless us in the name of Jesus, for we're coming in his name. And the explicit promise of the word of God, of that Savior God, is that when you come to God in my name, I'm going to be with you. God's going to hear, and everything you pray for will be heard and answered, and you'll be blessed. So, Father... Our burdens we cast upon you, as you say for us to do, and we believe that you will truly take those burdens and you will bear them for us. Give us to bear them with grace, which is such a comfort. Lord, we, we give you praises. We would heap upon you praises, your reputation. We would honor by honorable conduct, by good thoughts, by believing in the reconciling blood of Jesus when with others we are estranged. 
We pray, Father, that you would bless our congregation, that it may truly know you as our God. The God of sovereign grace is the God of sovereign grace. The God of sinners here displayed in our lives, in our fruit, in our being good stewards of this building that you have provided for us and of the monies that we are given on your behalf. You provided for us in so many ways, spiritual leaders and elders and ministers of truth and mercy and deacons and a pastor who loves the flock, who loves the word of God, who loves the glory and the praise of God. And all of us together, Lord, responding to the word that is preached, the word that Jesus speaks to us every single week and from week to week. Here is a great and blessed place that you have blessed with your presence and we can hardly think why. We wonder, we wonder, Lord, as we wander on this earth, why, why in the world we are so blessed to be your people, so best blessed to congregate, to be united, so that if there's any differences of opinion, these things are minor and there's things simply about that, that do not matter. But if there's differences of other things, then, and these things matter, there's always that cross. There's always that avenue of faith whereby we all go and we find forgiveness there and we find that Jesus would have us to be one. Lord, this is his prayer, that they may all be one, even as the Father and the Son are one in heaven, even as that wonderful Trinity unites in love in its being and there is this communion on earth reflecting that divine union. God, we pray, bless us. We pray, bless so that we can truly know that you're caring for us in all the seasons of life. We pray for the Wallinga family as Nicole is given in marriage this week. We pray, Father, that your, her beginning and her husband's may be in the name of the Lord, that there may be this true confidence that you are guiding them as you've guided them thus far so that a marriage may be consecrated to be a picture of Christ and his church. This may be for peace. This may be for blessing. May the families that say goodbye also say hello to a spouse and in-law that we, they may know the increase that you give even in the hard things of life. Lord God, may each of the family truly understand the sacrifices that Jesus made, the sacrifice that he made, and, and the many sacrifices that God's people make truly and simply to be holy, to walk in this world as not of it, to walk as a family of God, even though you bless us with earthly families. May this be the lesson for them and for all of us, as together we lift up in prayer the needs of spouses being married, and also Nathaniel and Cassandra in their being newly wed. We pray, give them, Lord, to continue to grow in their love for one another. Bless also those bearing children. We pray for them, that they may have a, a good delivery, that the baby may be healthy and the mother. And Lord, we pray that you would bless all the families here and the individuals in every season of life, younger, growing up, maturing and older and in getting older and even infirm. God bless us all. We are those, Lord, who go through time and we go through time looking to you who are the eternal God who changes not. And therefore, we're not consumed. In these seasons of life, we pray for wisdom and grace, contentment and peace and courage. For you are the God who knows them all. You sent your son to empathize with us Knowing all things except our sin, that is, he never had sin, but he can empathize, and he's the great high priest, and he knows perfectly everything we go through, every bit of our path, what a great Savior he is. And so we pray, Father, that you would give us your blessing upon the word we hear now. We hear of hearts and words. We hear of blessings and cursings. We hear of the truth as it is in Jesus, and we are eager to hear and to take home and to believe by faith and to walk by faith according to the things we hear. So, Father, we'll go away 
and you'll dismiss us with your good favor and send us on our way into this week, into this wonderful week that's ahead of us. Grace going to meet us every single day. The blood of Jesus cleansing our sins. Your gift of faith overcoming our unbelief and giving us to walk as those who are persuaded of the great and deep things of God. Lord, hear our prayers for your blessing upon the rest home ministry of this church and your servant. We pray that the word that was fed to the flock there today may truly bear fruit in the, among those of infirmities and agedness. God, have mercy upon them. Have mercy upon us all. Give us more work to do if it's your good pleasure. And always we pray for good work to do and the good and Holy Spirit within that we may be good. Your people with good hearts who love you, who love the Lord together, and who fumble and stumble so many times in life, but who are those who are resilient because you pick us up and you say, get back up, start walking again. I forgive you. I love you. Learn from this. Keep growing. Keep going. Hear our prayer for this church, for your church, wherever it is. We are just a little flock, but God, you are the God of a great and innumerable host, and we pray that you would bless each and every one. We are aware that the church is, is in hard times, especially in these anti-Christian days. We see this in the politics around us, in the policies and laws that are passed, and we are being restricted here and there and on every side in different ways. Surely, Father, this reeks of antichrist, and we pray to be discerning, and that our young people may be discerning and not for a minute, bear the mark of the beast, the mark of man, that we be godly. Pray for those persecuted. We thank, Lord, of our Chinese brothers and sisters in that uh, place, and we pray that you would bless them as they must go in hiding. Places, Lord, all over the world and in our own country where there is persecution, and there's the constant persecution of the poison that the devil would offer us through what looks like Kool-Aid or something that's good. May we not drink, Lord. May we not die the slow death of compromise. May our theology be pure and our life. And may it be, Lord, about you, serving you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And for his sake, amen. Your offering at this time will be received for the general fund. Let's sing that number, 290. O Lord, my inmost heart and thought, thy searching eye doth see. Wherever I rest, where'er I go, my ways are known to thee. This is a great comfort, this uh, Psalm 139. And we're going to be thinking of hearts today and, and words that come from hearts. And we know that the Lord knows our hearts. And that's the great and comforting thought to every one of us, no matter where we go. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, as we seek God's will, we have the light of the Lord shining upon us. No reason to fear, every reason to trust God. So let's sing the five stanzas, 290.
I'd like us to read from two passages from sacred scripture tonight. And the first is from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. The second is from the book of Matthew, chapter 12. So we'll read first from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, in which is recorded the uh, word of God regarding the first sin of man and woman and the devil tempting Eve and then Eve tempting Adam and the consequences of this. We're going to read at verse 14 through verse 19 the effect of the, the fall. And it's after Adam and Eve have given their excuses to God as to why they did what they did. And then God pronounces two things, blessing and cursing. And uh, we often don't think that um, there's blessing and cursing together here, but they are. So let's, let's uh, think of this in verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, I'll be the snake children, there was a, or it'll be the devil who was in the serpent. Because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. Now before that, there was this walking, talking snake. And now he slides on his belly. And you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And here's what we commonly know as the mother promise. It's also not just a promise of blessing, but it's a promise of cursing. I will put enmity between you and the woman. A note here that God is talking to the devil. And he's saying, I'm going to put enmity, that is, I'm going to build a wall of spiritual separation between you, the devil, and the woman, Eve, who represents the church, the mother of all living, and between your seed, the devil's seed, and between her seed, the woman's seed, that would be the elect of God in the church. There's going to be a spiritual separation there. The devil will not have his way with all of humankind. God has his elect. And he shall bruise your head. Now, this is a reference to the seed, that is Jesus, who crushes the devil in his work on the cross. And you, Satan, shall bruise his heel. It's going to hurt Jesus. He's going to be crucified. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. As far we read the narrative of the history of the fall, and God's blessing after that and his cursing, Genesis chapter 3. Turn now to Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to read this chapter that might not seem to be related at all to Genesis 3, but hold on and we'll, we'll link these passages together as indeed they are together. As we read here, Jesus' response to the Pharisees, <clears throat> he continues speaking to them and to the crowd. Verse 33, verse 37, uh, these words in between, all of them, my passage for my sermon tonight. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, and really the word make there is consider the tree good and its fruit good, or else make or consider, uh, know that the tree is bad and its fruit is bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. If you know the tree, you'll know the fruit. If it's a good tree, you'll know it has good fruit and so on. And then he looks at those snakes. And you can imagine this, Jesus looking at the Pharisees and the scribes, brood of vipers, the whole brood of vipers, offspring of the devil. Now you're thinking about Genesis 3, the seed of the snake, brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, bring or speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. 
Thus far the words of Jesus, and may God bless us as we seek to understand just what the Savior, the very Word of God, is speaking to us as he did to scribes and Pharisees and to the multitudes way back then in Palestine. Our text is, as we know, a part of the Beelzebub controversy. That is, Jesus had uh, behold, uh, beheld one who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. Apparently, from this demon possession, he couldn't see and he couldn't talk. Perhaps he couldn't hear either, but he couldn't talk. We know this because Jesus then healed the man and he saw and he spoke. So this was this great miracle. You think of the Savior working miracles all over the place. This one seems to have astounded the multitude more than they all that had proceeded. At least to a great degree, they were really moved by this casting out of the demon, this healing of the man blind, and this opening of his lips so that he spoke. The response, in fact, was that in verse 23 we read, all the multitudes were amazed. They were just dumbfounded. They were stupefied. Now, Jesus had done many miracles again before, but this one, this amazed them and got them to thinking, could this be the son of David? That's their question. And what they're doing here is matching up Jesus and his words and his deeds with what the Bible says of one who's called the son of David, who is the Messiah. Everywhere in the Old Testament, Messiah is said to be the son of David, who would establish the kingdom of David and his throne forever and ever, the Savior from God. And so the, the, the multitudes are saying and hoping, this Jesus, could he be son of David? But when the Pharisees and the scribes heard it, and they had been gathered together to, to catch Jesus, they were already his enemies. When they heard that, this multitude said that, and that they were in danger of losing these people to follow Jesus, they slandered Jesus and said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, that rather unusual name for Satan, ruler of the demons. Well, Jesus, as we've seen in prior sermons, he refuted that logic. He said it's not logical that uh, one who had a demon should cast out demons because then the kingdom would be divided against itself. It would not be strong. The devil's wiser than that. So Jesus in, in many in different ways, too, has said he truly is casting out this demon by the Spirit of God, and you should know that when Jesus does this or anyone does this, the kingdom of God is upon you. And so he silences and refutes the scribes and Pharisees and declares himself to be indeed the Messiah in so many words. Now, our narrative reminds us, in fact, that this whole business here of people reacting to Jesus, especially his enemies, and then Jesus reacting to them, is indeed a war of words. There's a war of words going on here. Jesus is the word of God, and the Pharisees are speaking lies about the word of God. The Pharisees are saying their lies about the word of God, and Jesus is fighting back, as it were, contending with them with the truth. And displaying in every way that he is on the side of God. And so it's this war of words. Now this takes us back, this is Genesis 3, back to Genesis. Because from the very beginning, this has been what life is all about in this fallen world. The devil came to Eve with words, lies, and questioning God. Yea, has God said, you may not eat of this forbidden tree. Yea, is God fair. Yea, is this right by you. Yea, doesn't this cramp your style? That's what Satan said to Eve and tempted her to disbelieve God and even to be on the side of the devil who promised that they would be as gods if they ate of the forbidden fruit. So the word of the devil came up against the word of God at the very, very beginning. And then God, of course, would not have the devil have his way, though he, he, the devil got 
uh, Eve and then Adam to eat of the tree and the whole human race fell, God would speak the definitive word, and that's Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and so on. The word of God was doing battle in the garden. Now when Jesus comes, he directs everyone to himself as the word of God embodied. The word of God for all of your lives, for your marriages, for your families, for your single life, for your church. The word of God. And in the war, that word of God triumphs. We need not fear the slanders of men or even our own doubtful words and conjectures about the future because the word of God, Jesus says, is the amazing thing. And strikingly, Jesus speaks to the fact that in the hearts of God's people, and he does this by uh, this language that he uses about trees and hearts and, and fruit and so on, he puts in the hearts of God's people his own good word so that they are the seed of the woman, the elect of God, chosen and then chosen out of the world to be his people and to represent him. So we want to consider of hearts and words. Jesus speaks of hearts and words and also cursing and blessing. We want to speak of that too, the gospel behind these hearts and words. First of all, some always truths. Jesus mentions here generalities here about trees and fruit and hearts and, 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 um, and words, and we need to know what he's talking about here. And then we need to apply this to this incident here 2,000 years ago, and then bring it up to date. How does this apply today, hearts and words and cursing and judgment? And then we want to think of these last two words that are only here in the New Testament about being justified uh, by our words or condemned by our words, being judged for every idle word we speak or every word that is reflective of our, the machinations of our heart, being judged according to that. There's a stark warning here. So first of all, then, what is the principles that Jesus is bringing out here when he says, kind of in the middle of this, this lengthy passage against the scribes and Pharisees and explaining what he's all about as the Word of God, when he brings up this idea of tree and either make or consider the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. There's a general statement here. What Jesus is saying is that the inside of a tree is known by the outside of a tree. That is, if there's good fruit on the outside, you can be sure, generally speaking, that the inside, the root, and the pulp, and whatever causes the tree to grow inside is healthy. And if it's not good, if the fruit is bad, there's something wrong with the tree. The root and the leaves or the inside of the tree, the whole tree itself is producing this bad fruit. And then Jesus speaks of the heart, and he speaks of people. And he speaks here of the heart being like a treasure chest and words coming from the heart that reveal what the heart is. That word treasure is used, in fact, of the chest that was used by the wise men to bring out their gold and frankincense and myrrh and to give it to Jesus. It's this receptacle. The, house is, the heart is like a storehouse. And in it, the Bible says, are the issues of life what shows what the inner man is. So Proverbs 4 says, out of the heart are the issues or the goings forth of life. So Jesus is talking about a tree. It's known by its fruit, good or bad, and then a heart. And the abundance of a heart is this overflowing place like your natural heart designed to pump blood into all of the body. The heart, the spiritual heart, is this place from whence comes well, either the work of God or the work of devil, depending on whether you're evil or good and God has blessed you or not, so that something is known of your heart in the words that come out of your heart, out of your lips. Words are special indicators of what's inside. What are your delights? What have you been thinking about or not? Or that you've been thinking about nothing and you just have idle words or frivolous talk that comes out of your, your, your mouth. It shows where your heart's been. 
And so Jesus is speaking here against Freud and against all of those who say when you misspeak yourself, that's a Freudian slip. He's speaking, saying instead that there's a reality that comes to fore when you speak words. It either speaks of an idleness and a bad treasure, or it speaks of a purposefulness and a goodness that um, God has been working in you and to which you've been responding well by faith and so that you have good fruit, good words, like a tree. So trees and fruits and hearts and the fruits of words. And Jesus is speaking about all of this. And what he's doing here is speaking in general, and we want to speak in general first and then to apply it to the scribes and Pharisees in this incident and then to our day, but he's speaking in general of this. When God makes human beings, he makes them so that they have a heart, which is like the command center, in which he either lead, he makes them with a heart so that they can praise him. That's how he originally made Adam and Eve. So that Adam and Eve themselves, by their hearts, would love God in their hearts, and then in their words, they would show that they loved God, that God was on their heart all the time, that he was their, their number one, that he was their all in all, their life and their joy, walking in the cool of the garden. And as they executed their, their calling to fulfill the, uh, subdue the earth and fill it. Well, God made it that way. But what happened was Satan attacked the heart. He attacked Eve at the heart. He attacked Eve at the heart of her commitment to God and said and, and tempted her to think that she should not be so committed to God because God was not faithful and God was not to be trusted because he's limiting their style and he's, he's actually limiting their, their potential, as people would say today. And so out of the heart that was tempted now and fell into the temptation, Eve produced words, debating with the devil. Not a good thing ever to debate with the devil. You never debate with the devil. Uh, you say, go away, devil, get out of here, devil, in the name of Jesus, but you don't debate with the devil. She did. And she got into trouble. She began thinking worse and worse of God and indeed took of the forbidden fruit, and the rest is history. Adam did too. The heart, in fact, as a result of the fall, became corrupt. The heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah says, and who can know it? Very, very evil. That's why the psalm we read, uh, we sang from, Psalm 139, David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. If there be any wicked way, root it out. He himself knows the, the natural tendency of the heart, and we should all know that. The heart is the problem, and our words reflect that. So this is how it goes. And generally speaking, then, there is this knowing a good person or a bad person, a child of God or one who's a child of the devil, as we'll see the, 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 the Pharisees were, by their words. And so a child of God will speak good words, and a child of the devil will speak bad words, untrue words. And principally, the whole issue comes down to this. What do you think of the word of God, of the word of God Jesus Christ revealed? How do your words reflect that you love the word of God, the truth of God? If you speak not well of the Son of God, your words will show that you in your heart are corrupt and you are against God, as at the beginning. You are yet in your sins. If you love God, you will show by praises. You will show by good conversation. You will show by what you receive from the world and its media and what you want to receive that you are a lover of truth and you want to dwell and have the word of Christ dwell in you. So these are the generalities here, the general truths. And what Jesus is saying here, and this is the then part of the always, is that the Pharisees uh, ought, are, are to be known by who they are. And he knows who they are. He knows the hearts. He knows the thoughts. They seem to have good words. They seem to have good words. But Jesus is saying to them, how can you, being evil, speak good things? 
What he's referring to is the thing they've just said about him. You Pharisees have just said that I'm of the devil. And you've been saying that all along, but now you say it again. And you're trying to, to quench the Holy Spirit and to keep these multitudes from believing on me. How can you, being evil, I know your heart, Jesus is saying, speak good things. And so Jesus is undermining them because he's looking at their hearts and saying, you're speaking lies. Evident they should be these lies because what I've just said and what I've just done, evidently displaying the spirit of God and the kingdom come, you brood of vipers, you son of the snake and of Satan himself. So Jesus is applying general principles here, and he's seeking to undermine and undercut any, any uh, plan and, and uh, uh, to undermine Jesus' mission and to keep the people of God from believing on him. So that's what he says here. And this is exactly what we see today and what we ought to know today. Jesus is making this claim here about tree no might's fruit, and the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak, that we might be on guard about our words and about the words of anybody else. This is how we can know what people are all about, especially what they say they think about Jesus. What they say they think about the gospel. What they say they think about the faith of our fathers living still. What they say they think about the truths of the doctrines of the church, the sovereignty of God in salvation, what they say about man, and they put him up on a pedestal, and they're saying that Jesus is not the Jesus that he needed to be, the complete Savior, because man can save himself. What they say about hell, what they say about heaven, it reveals their heart. And if the heart is crooked, then truly their words will be crooked. We must beware. We must beware. Well, this is applicatory to us. We should be those who are obviously concerned about speaking evil words. We don't want to speak evil words, do we? Children, I hope your parents warn you away about any bad words, naughty words, cursing and swearing, anything that approximates that, anything that's not true, anything that is not edifying, any idle, frivolous talk, the Bible often words against the, uh, warns against the sins of the tongue, and so Jesus is doing that here. And even sp saying that we're going to be judged in our day, in the day of days, by what we say, what we have said, what we've wasted our time saying, and also hearing. Because this is truly the case. Jesus knows, and we know, that we speak what's on our heart. And what's on our heart happens to come from what we listen to quite a bit. If we're listening to all kinds of evil stuff and lies and, and all kinds of bad stuff that's against the gospel and not even remotely related to edifying, we're going to be hurt from it. What's the saying? Garbage in, garbage out. If you're feeding on garbage, there's going to be garbage that comes from your, from your heart and it shows in your lips. You'll have gutter talk, as my mother used to call it. Well, yes, indeed. And so we should keep ourselves from that. Indeed, in this age of media and all kinds of stuff, there's all kinds of stuff that is even halfway good, opinions of people. This day of politics and things that are encroaching on us from the politics and their decision and they're requiring this and that of us in an era of a pandemic, we need to be careful about what we hear lest we be filled simply with opinions. Now, let me address this. We are called to be a people of the word here. Jesus is warning us to guard our hearts, to be a people of the word, so that our hearts are filled with good treasure, good stuff, Jesus Christ and his truth, and all of the truth of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Well then, we ought to be guarding ourselves from just spending our time hearing opinions, hearing opinions of this and of that. Even if it bears, directly or indirectly, on our life, we have to have a balance. 
Be in the Word. Be in the Word. Be in the Word. What would you rather have your pastor uh, listen to all day? Fox News, CNN, or some other broadcast? Or sermons? Or the Word of God expounded and read? I'd rather be much in the Word here. And even though the temptation would be to have my head in the sand, as it were, and not be in touch with reality, nevertheless, I believe that as God blesses me in having the word brought to my attention and into my heart so I feast upon it, I'll be able to connect with the people and be able to teach the word of God as it applies to you today simply because the word of God is ever relevant. And so we speak these things that seem to be high and mighty and just deep theology, but as sure as God has come to this earth, Theology comes to the earth if it be true because the theology that we would learn from the Bible is the Christology, is the soteriology, is all the ologies, all the teachings, and all of it centered in Jesus Christ. The truth is in Jesus. That's the beauty of the Bible. You study that, and you're studying all of history. You're studying math. You're studying the stars. You're studying earth science and everything you need to know. I'm not saying... in and minimizing the need for learning other things and learning things also from other textbooks and so on. But beware of mere opinions and filling your life with all of this kind of talk that goes around that may be true, may be not true, may be indeed um, uh, bearing on our life, but we need to be in the Word of God. And so... We avoid evil words and opinions and receiving them, lest our words show and begin to show that we're more interested in, in gutter talk or just spouting opinions than in the Word of God. But also, we have to learn to be careful about what I would call the religious mix. There's theories that go around <clears throat> that would say that there's much good in the world, and from the much good in the world and the culture and the words and the philosophies and the art and the economics and the political theories of the world, we can learn much because, so gets the theory, we are, after all, not only people of the kingdom of heaven, but there's a common kingdom that we all share. We call it Reform Two Kingdoms theory, but this is a common kingdom. So, as Noah was blessed and all the earth in him seems to be, then there is this blessing that God gives to all of the world and all of the culture, and we can learn from this. And we can learn from this not only to cooperate with this common kingdom, even as God's people, and give glory to God and overcome and, and defeat uh, evil in the culture wars, and set, et cetera. Well, the danger here is that our heart takes in things from the world that are said to be good, but they might not be good. And this is where the devil comes, not with wooden shoes, so you can hear them, but in slippers. So let's be careful about this. Here's what the Canons of Dort say, the Reformed Creed about the things, the so-called good things of the world. And I read here from Canons 3.4, Article 4. This is the issue here, very important issue in the Reformed community today. There remain, however, even though everyone is conceived in sin and by nature evil, there remain, however, in man since the fall, Genesis 3, glimmerings of natural light, or the common kingdom people would say natural law, and common grace, they'd say, whereby the fallen man retains some knowledge of God, of natural things, and of the difference between good and evil, and shows some regard for virtue and for good outward behavior. But so far is this light of nature from being sufficient to bring him to a saving knowledge of God and to true conversion, he's incapable of using this natural light even in things natural and civil. Nay, further, and here's the, the sticker, this light, such as it is, man in various ways renders wholly polluted and hinders in unrighteousness by doing which he becomes inexcusable before God. Now I'm getting into this and spending some time here because it indirectly is very, very important for our living here as people of the Word and having the Word in our heart, the Word of God, the Bible, 
the gospel, the faith of our fathers. If we are learning too much from the world, the warning is, watch it. Because the world, fallen world, that's what I'm referring to here, the world, the fallen world, is not a good tree. It doesn't have a good heart. It doesn't have a good collective heart. And out of an evil tree, therefore, comes evil fruit. Out of an evil heart, even of a collective heart of society, though it may be well-intended, comes evil. This is the word of God, of Jesus here. Call it good or call it evil. It's not good and evil together. So Jesus is indicting the entire world, bringing it before the bar of the word of God and saying, what is fallen is fallen and cannot pick itself up again and cannot be an edification for you who have the word of God and that's all you need. Now, to be sure, we're not talking about here of a retreat from culture. So we can't play the violin. We can't play the piano. We can't learn from the greats in art and so on. We can't read Dostoevsky and all of these people. We are saying, however, that we must be careful and drink in, though we might sip from the culture, drink in the word. Drink in all of it and take it in and have that influence your life and your togetherness and your communion. Be careful. Be careful of the unequal yokes. Be careful of being more cultured than Christian. The whole issue is here, what is the relation between Christ and culture? And Jesus, in blasting the Pharisees, is also blasting the entire world that would not have him as its word and its savior. This is the instruction for us. Be careful. Be careful about evil. Be careful about mere opinions. Be careful about the mix the deadly mix of lie and truth, of some sort of good, but of a good which the canons teach us is wholly destroyed by their pushing under the real good in unrighteousness and denying the truth of Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Son of God. Oh, so very important, because there's a judgment. And that's what Jesus brings out in these last two verses. Here, as no other place in the New Testament, as far as I can say, he says, I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. That is, for every useless word, vain word, empty word, any word that speaks of the fact that you're just fallen, you're part of the vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. For every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. Now this includes, of course, the treasure that comes out of a heart, the treasure of words, so that not only idle words, Jesus speaks of that, but also words that you've thought about, words that uh, behind which are thoughts, so that you're intentional in your speaking and you're not just throwing out things at the bar and, and, and speaking about this to your buddies, but it's this intentional philosophy or whatever you're trying to get across or maybe an intentional slander of the Son of God, whatever it is. All of these words, idle or not, they are those which God will, does listen to and will bring you to account for on the judgment day. And that's the re reference here to the judgment day. Now, this is a warning. And our canons of Dort faithfully remind us that warnings are good in the Bible. We need warnings. We're kept through warnings. We're guarded through threatenings of judgments and damnation. We're guarded. These are all ways that God would preserve the elect seed who would fear God and fear hellfire as we much more than we would fear an oven to touch an oven with our finger. Well, the judgment here, it's warning. Jesus is bringing this to the Pharisees, to the people who are almost Christian. They're amazed at his miracles. Could not this be the Son of God? And also today to us, to those who are being Pharisaistic or downright hedonistic, or those who are halfway in, 
those who are wondering, and those who are walking with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, those who are trying to be more cultured than Christian and all of this stuff, Jesus is warning us. What's your conversation look like? Does it show that your heart is it's not right with me and that the word of God is not in your heart? Where are you at? What do your words say? Your thoughts say? What do they say to you? What do your words say of you? Really, your conversations, what, your interests, what do you get excited about? Really thrilled about? What occupies your time and your taking in information? How do we fare here, beloved? How do we fare? What is in our hearts? The Lord knows. We need to know. Wonderful thing is, as we feel ashamed, and we should, of our often drinking from the wrong fountains, wasting our time, frittering away a conversation with things that aren't near as important as edifying things. That's to our shame. But what is comforting is this. There is a judgment, but we are not judged on the basis of our words or our works. Remember that. The Bible teaches that we're judged according to our works. Jesus speaks here. It says, by your words... According to them, by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. And what Jesus is saying here is something like James. He's saying in the judgment day, we're going to show, the judgment will show what has been on your heart. It will show that you are justified or you are condemned. It will show where your heart is. It will show not only the words that you frittered away your time with, but it will show the words of apologies, I'm sorry for my sins. It will show the words of your prayers. Well meant because God in your heart is working in you to speak words of petition and words of praise. Yes, remember that in light of the whole of the Bible. There will be a judgment and a justification or condemnation according to the words. But remember this, what is in your heart is not just you, but Christ in you. And finally, the great comfort is this. At the judgment day, God will look at us and he will speak to us a word, enter into the joy of the Lord. Because, after all, the basis of our judgment is the word of God that God has spoken in Jesus. You are not the ground for your being saved. Your merits are not your eloquent words, your great prayers. That was Phariseeism, what Jesus was combating. But Jesus is the Savior. Jesus who speaks the word. Jesus who speaks to us demon-possessed and worldly ones who are so prone to wander away from the path, which is hard. He speaks to us, and he says, I love you. And he speaks to us, and they say, I dwell in you. Now come to me. Stop being a little babe. Grow up. Stop being wandering and prone to wander. Come to me and be filled with me. On the judgment day, God will speak to us the word of Christ once again. And he'll say, for Jesus' sake, you're cleansed of all of your idle words and all of your self-righteous words and all of your... your wandering down rabbit holes in life instead of pursuing the, the straight course of service to God. God will forgive us because his word is sure. His word is grace. Remember that, dear ones. The word of God be in you and abide with you. Whatever you're doing this week, the word of God speak to you. Hear it and be glad. And then speak the praises of God to the wonderful glory of God, we shall go. God helping us, and he will. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the word. We pray that you would remember, 
the offerings of our broken spirits and contrite hearts, and the words that we utter, which are so often mumbling and which don't say it right and enough that we love you and we praise you. God bless each and every one of us with good hearts, and may we be good trees planted by the riverside of your grace, blessed men and women and children, blessed in our single life, blessed in our marriages, blessed in our families, blessed as churchmen, blessed, Lord, in this world to show everyone God has spoken. He's spoken in these latter days by his Son, and calling sinners everywhere to come to the Savior, to take his word in our hearts, to receive him, who is the Blessed One, and over all, forever and ever. For his sake we pray, amen. Let's sing now from number eight, O Jehovah, hear my words. After the benediction, we'll sing 325 in your bulletin. May we receive now the word of God's peace and go in peace. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, 
working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen. Thank you.